Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Wine can of their wits, the wise beguile, make the sage frolic and the serious smile is a quote from the author of some of the great epics in history, the Greek poet Homer. I thought this was a fitting quote for our guest today. The leader of one of the world's largest wine companies, with over 70 brands sold in more than 70 countries, grown in thousands of hectares of vineyards and some of the most recognisable regions in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, America and China. Our guest is Tim Ford, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Treasury Wine Estates Limited a world leader in wine with a remarkable global footprint, home of some of the world's finest award-winning brands, including Australia's very own Panfolds. Prior to his appointment, Tim held the roles of Chief Operating Officer, Managing Director Europe, Southeast Asia, Middle East and Africa, as well as Director Global Supply. He also previously held Senior Management roles of National Foods and Carlton and United Breweries. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners from all over the world, please don't forget to follow on your preferred podcast platform and share with your friends and colleagues. And for our listeners in Bordeaux, Tuscany and the Napa Valley, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blender Partners, Executive Search and Board Advisory. In an enriching conversation, Tim offers us a unique perspective into the tantalizing world of wines. From their premium offerings at the center of some of life's most important celebrations, to the humble drop we savor at the end of a long day. We learn of the remarkable advancements in cultivation and the difference in tastes in catering to the many palates of the world. Tim also shares with us a story of passion and drive, which has allowed Treasury Wine Estates to navigate a nuanced geopolitical situation, and continue its evolution as a global leader in its industry. So sit back and enjoy making every day count. Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks, Greg. Good to, good to have the opportunity to talk to you. Maybe just get us on a bit of a roll, Tim. What's uh, what's your favourite bottle of wine? Well, I get asked that question a lot. And uh, so, look, the, my favourite's a uh, Napa Valley Petit Syrah, which is our Stags Leap winery brand out of the US, and pro- probably for different reasons. It's uh, not not because of the quality of the wine, because there's lots of great quality wines around, of course, but uh, it's more the memories that uh, that, that uh, brings back to me, and that's the, the great part about you know I think what everyone's favourite wine is. It's what do you, what do you link back to that wine? And when I lived in the Napa Valley. Uh, for a couple of years with my family when I was over there working with us out with our business. Yeah, Stag's Leap was a special place where, you know, my kids love to go in there. It's a fantastic uh, site, you know, the vineyards and the like. So it always brings back great memories where we used to just hang out there on weekends and, uh, and enjoy our time as a family. So that, that's why it's sort of pretty special. Plus, it's an outstanding wine. What are we seeing changing, Tim, in, in tastes for wine? I see uh, recently an Audi bottle of wine, $8, I think it was was named best uh, wine in Australia in 2021. And then you've got those who prefer the more expensive. Well, what are we seeing? Is there any sort of trends we've seen in the last 24 months? The big trend that continues and has just escalated through the last 24 months, particularly through the pandemic, is what I call uh, drinking better but drinking less. Um, so, you know, a lot of consumers are now paying more for an individual bottle of wine but buying less bottles of wine. Yeah, that's something we see continuing as well. The high, high quality, less quantity, which I think overall is a, a good thing. Yeah, so certainly a good thing for our business, but I think certainly a good thing for the category as well. 
you originate from Adelaide? I did, born and bred Adelaide, so uh, lived there for my first 21 years. And mum and dad were in the uh, pub business, is that correct? Yeah, they were. They were. They, uh, yeah, I grew, grew up around sort of pubs, uh, you know, pretty much, pretty much my whole, uh, whole, you know, first 20 years. Not an easy life. Requires a lot of uh, discipline, hard work, a lot of engagement of community. Well, I guess from a, from a business perspective, but even, I guess, outlook in general, what would you take away from it? Yeah, look, I think the, the importance of that environment and you know, getting together and the social connection that comes from that environment, I think it's just a fantastic part of society. You know, it's, uh, whether it's here or in other parts of the world, you know, the, the importance of getting friends, family together and, you know, just having a good time is, uh, is really important. You know, growing up around pubs, you probably see the downside of, uh, yeah. you know, the uh, alcohol industry as well. So I think it gave me a, a downside being, you know, overconsumption and the, the negative impacts that, um, you know, that can have on families, etc. You do see that. So, you know, I saw both the good and bad at a pretty young age. And, um, you know, it opens your eyes to reality, opens your eyes to what is society. But I think it's given me a very good lens of the responsibility we have um, as an organisation and an industry as well. But, uh you know, it's, it, most people can say they've had a pretty good time at a pub or a bar over the years, uh, you know, with their friends and family, can't they? Yeah, they certainly can. And you look, you didn't want to pursue that as a um, as an opportunity further on in life, following the footsteps of the family, run the business? No, 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 <laughs> I uh, I didn't. I never never had a great, uh, great desire to do so, I think, uh, partly because, you know, I don't know, I'm one of those people that doesn't really want to follow what my parents did. Um, in a lot of cases, great examples, don't get me wrong, but uh, from a business point of view, I would have sort of forged my own path. But um, no, nah, look, it's a, it's a seven day a week, you know, 18 hour, you know, job that, uh, you yeah, know, it's something that uh, I didn't really want to launch into at a young age. No, but I still guess in the, in the past time, you were a pretty handy cricketer from what I've read. Under 19, South Australian captain, that's, that's, um, that's no mean feat. I was okay, no doubt. Now, I'm not, I don't uh, hide from that. I had some talent when it came to cricket, but, uh, you know, I realised uh, pretty quickly. I was I was good, but I wasn't good enough to make a, uh, a career out of cricket. And, uh, you know, when I was about 19, 20, after that, those state underage teams, you sort of go into the pool of everyone else after the underage teams. And uh, whilst I could hold my own, I was never going to be a standout. So uh, I decided to pursue my business career pretty quickly. What were you, opening bat or opening bowler or all-rounder? I was actually a wicketkeeper. Really? A uh, wicketkeeper who could uh, who could bat a bit. I, uh, you know, I wish 2020 cricket was around in my day because I tried to play... Uh, you know, full day, four day cricket, like a, a 2020 play, which means I generally got out for about 20 every time I went out to bat. But, um, you know, and that was the era where Adam Gilchrist started to uh, come to the fore, ruined it for every other wicketkeeper <laughs> batsman around the world who uh, thought they were doing pretty well at averaging 20, batting at number seven. So I was a keeper for first and foremost. Yeah, he changed the game, but it's certainly difficult to be a keeper and a um, skipper. Yeah, it was. Um, it, partly, yes. I mean, the other side of it is you see the game Absolutely. differently as being a keeper and you're in the game every ball so you know the concentration side of it was was pretty uh pretty intense at times when you do that but you know what's going on and you could read the game really well from behind the stump so you know i, I quite enjoyed the combination of it so playing at that level as a, as a young man what what do you reckon cricket sort of brought to you which you've taken into business because obviously it's a game of chess in, in certain parts it's wearing down the oppositions it's studying the opposition and you can't hide can you no, I'll learn a huge amount. And it's, um, yeah, I think the can't hide bit's important as well. You sort of, there's moments in games of cricket where you've got to stand up or there's moments where you can fail miserably, you know. And it's, uh, yeah, I think that's that's the beauty of that game. Um, you know, and the fact is you're spending such a significant amount of time with a group of people. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, when uh, in my career anyway, I spent a lot of time when we were batting on the sidelines because I wasn't out there long batting. <laughs> but uh, you know, when you when you're spending eight hours a day every Saturday and Sunday with the same group of people, yeah, you learn a lot about people and you learn to understand them. You learn how to get the best out of them, what makes them tick, and uh, you know, you really do. Uh, particularly for me as a younger younger person playing with men as well, you know, it was a real eye opener to how you build that chemistry within a group of people and when it's when it works and when it doesn't. It didn't always for some of those teams. So I learned a huge amount, I reckon, from uh, from those early days. Probably more than I would have thought at the time. Well, were well, you a natural skipper? Yeah, I always like, I like to lead. Yeah, I like. I was always as a keeper as well. I was always very verbal. You know, that's <laughs> uh, that's your that's your role is to be the energizer of the team and the 
you know, and the guy on the team that was uh, was really leading from the front from an energy point of view, bringing everyone up and making sure that uh, you know the standards across the board were were met, particularly in the field. So, you know, I love that sort of. I love the tactics of the game. Yeah. You know, I love the uh, how you change the game. I mean, I was always one of those one of those people that thought of what's next. You know, how do you actually change it when someone's having a hundred run partnership and you really look like you're not making any progress? What do you do differently? You know, whether that be shift everyone onto the field of the offside just to get in the batsman's head, because yep. uh, clearly they were uh, they were beating us from the uh, the actual game of cricket. But uh, yeah, so it's it fantastic from that point of view. Always trying things. So I love the leadership. So who, who do you admire as the skippers? Is that the, the likes of the uh, the Ian Chappells of the world who probably would would move the field around so much? Or Darren Lehman. Darren, Darren Lehman, Lehman really. Best. Yeah, yeah. Darren Lehman was the most innovative thinker around cricket that I, and I was fortunate. I did some work with him. I used to do some coaching on the side just as a, uh, you know, a, a give you some money to get through uni kind of job and uh, did a lot of it with Darren and, and his thought process and the way he played the game was the way he captained the game. He was, he was brilliant. Him and another guy, probably don't know, he didn't ever play for Australia, but he should have, Jamie Siddons. Oh, yeah, Jamie Siddons, yeah. You know, one of the highest civil children run scorers. You know, another guy that just thought about the game brilliantly. So, yeah, sort of look at those guys that I could get to know rather than, you know, at a test level that you know, I just didn't, didn't know those guys. So, but they were brilliant. The 1%, the 2%, the 3% you're talking about, the difference between those who are good and those who are super good. What does it come down to? Oh, a- application and, uh, you know, really that every day getting better. You know, the best players, I mean, th- there's a lot of talented, there's a lot of talented cricketers, you know, around in my uh, in my era as well. But these guys that made it and were successful from a career point of view just dedicated themselves to getting better every day and would really work at it, would really try and, and would back themselves. You know, that's, that's the thing I always struggle with a bit with cricket is, you know, yeah, they take the risks on the cricket field. I was never really good enough to get away with the risks. That was the problem. Um, but these guys that were, you know, they, they took risks, but they just took the game on. And uh, they, they, they changed the course of the games. They're the ones that really, really did uh, stand out. So you wanted to pursue a career in business whilst uh, you're, you know, you're swinging the bat and keeping it behind the stumps? Yeah, I, I only probably worked out, you know, because I did that sort of 18, 19 years of age, you know, I'd go to England to play and then I'd come back to Australia to play and do that for a couple of years. And then, so you're pretty handy. Then you're, un- you're underrating yourself, aren't you? No, not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> plenty, plenty, plenty that played with me would say I'm being pretty fair. But, uh, you know, and, and yeah, that, at that point in time, you could work out what do you want to do, you know, with your uh, with your career. Business business has always, had always interested me. You know, families are obviously in businesses, et cetera. But, um, yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, the the world of corporate business was something. I'm, I'm I'm not a real entrepreneur. Want to do it all on my own? That's not necessarily as, as much in my DNA as probably it was in my parents. So, you know, I certainly always saw myself, you know, working in a more a larger organisation environment. So, university, you you move into something in that in that area it was pretty, I guess, early days supply chain. Yeah, uh, well, I wouldn't have thought that was the most exciting of. Uh, degrees to pick but it was game on it was a good timing so it's a, it's actually a really it's a good story that probably sums up a bit of my whole career really where yeah after the first year of your business degree at uh, university of SA where i was you had to pick a major yep and um yeah so you go marketing or you go hr or you go uh, finance or logistics it was at the time so it wasn't even supply chain back then and of course no one had heard of logistics and uh, the lecturer who was leading that stream took me aside and said uh, what are you going to do? And I said, oh, probably marketing. He goes, oh, you can do that with the other 270 people of the 290 that were doing the degree. He goes, or you can think about this. And uh, he goes, it'll be the career path of the future. He goes, it's really an armed forces career path today. He goes, but, you know, I, I firmly believe that in the next 10 years, you know, career paths will open up in this spot. And it's going to be a really important part of every business across, uh, you know, across all industries. So, I said, yeah, okay, I'll think about it. I don't really understand it. He goes, it's, you good at numbers? I said, yep. He goes, okay, what's well, a lot about numbers? And so I walked away and he said, oh, and one other thing. He goes, there's no exams. <laughs> and uh, and I said, well, how do you measure? He goes, it's all case study based. You know, you'll go out to businesses and you'll go, so that, that sort of resonates yeah. with me. And the no exams, clearly, because I, <laughs> I didn't love exams. So uh, I was sold. I was sold. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I did that. And then fortunately at the end of it, you know, you then have the graduate program started to open up around logistics. So, yeah, there was me and one other guy basically that uh, 
had a logistics major and a business degree that sort of had the pick of uh, all the graduate programs that were opening up around around logistics and supply at that point. So um, hence, I went to BHP, which is the big Australian. So why wouldn't you? Yeah, you went to the big Australian, but you didn't stick around for too long with the big Australian. Oh, I had three years, three years of the program, which was um, was a great program. I went from Wollongong to Newcastle to Sydney, back to Adelaide, back to Sydney, and they moved you around every six months in different jobs. But um, unfortunately, their investment they made in all of us on that program sort of came to nothing because there was no roles, full time roles to move into at the end of it. Yeah. So um, yeah, I was. It's a. Yeah, I'm sure every, I'm sure everyone sort of seen this in some programs, but it was pretty dumb in terms of the investment we made. And yeah, I didn't uh, see myself as going anywhere else. But there was really nothing other than a sales job in Sydney, selling steel that was available to me. So I had to I had a look around. So you moved into the world of FMCG, very focused on the customer and the consumer. Yeah, moved to beer. So moved to uh, CUB yep. at the time, nineteen end of ninety nine, and. Um, the very fortunate time of when uh, Fosters was sponsoring the Olympics in Sydney, and um, my uh, my boss at the time, so I joined as a logistics analyst, and um, my my boss at the time got taken off onto another project, and one of his big jobs was running the supply for the Olympics, beer supply for the Olympics. Jeez, that's not small either. Not small, but it sort of doesn't sound like a job either, does it? Really, <laughs> and. Uh, so uh, fortunate, fortunately, he got taken off to something else, and uh, and he said to me, "Well, you need to go back up to Sydney and uh, you know, get set up for the Olympics and run beer supply for the Olympics." So uh, that's what I did for eighteen months. Do you remember the sort of the quantities we went through? Oh no, I, I don't. What I do know is that uh, we were so overprepared that we basically had all the stock in the venues for the complete Olympics, and we never actually replenished anything through the Olympics. So we'd, we'd organised ourselves around it, but. Uh, so I managed to enjoy the two weeks at the Olympics, fair to say, without too much pressure in terms of uh, you know, restocking bars and the likes around the place. But it was a lot. Yeah, but your career advanced. You moved to this group called Treasury Wine Estates, but that pretty much happened at the same time as they were, what, demerging from, from Foster's. Is that right? Same week. Yeah. So the week uh, Treasury demerged from the Foster's group was uh, the week I joined the business back in uh, 2011. So, you know, the op opportunity came because of the demerger, basically. Look, for the audience out there, what is Treasury Wine Estate? So we're a global global wine company, as uh, we call ourselves. Our ambition is uh, what to always start with is to be the most admired you know, premium wine company in the world. We sell about, uh, what's this year going to be, without giving the results away, circa 27 million cases of wine around the world, uh, which equates to about 330 million bottles of wine. So you know, it's large in scale across all markets, Asia, US, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, um, and pretty much 70, 77, 78 countries, uh, we sort of say is the, the major points of selling we have. I think the, the interesting part also is, you know, we've got about 12,500 hectares of vineyards. Yes. Uh, we also own, so one of the largest landholders, you know, certainly in the viticulture space. Where are they, Tim? Mostly Australia and the US. 90% Australia, US, California, New Zealand, France, and Italy are the uh, places we have our, our vineyards around the globe. So it's uh, it's quite a dispersed you know, footprint in terms of our brands that we have and the, the countries of origin that we supply around the world. And about 2,600 employees around the globe. So you've, uh, you have you commenced your career, what, 11, 12 years ago now, and you've moved around the world with, with that career. Uh, you want to share some insight, what different parts of the world are uh, how they're advancing their, I guess, their um, understanding of, of wine and uh, the opportunities with the industry? Yeah. Look, there's the, I'll, call, I'll put them into two two buckets, I suppose. You've got your mature markets and then you've got your emerging markets. And, um, you know, I think if you look at the US, you know, the largest wine market in the world, you know, Australia, 26 million people, two thirds the size of California. So, you know, an important wine market, but uh, not, not a significant scale wine market and the likes of the UK and some of the European you know, markets. The, the, it's just a very consistent trend of what I was talking about earlier around you know, premiumization of wine. You know, the what used to be an entry point of $5 is now an entry point of $12 bottle of wine. You know, people are buying more and more luxury wine yep. around the world. So yeah, that's quite consistent across all of those markets. And then you've got the emerging markets of Asia and, you know, my, we call them emerging, but they're significant you know, already today. But uh, yeah, they start with luxury wine. 
you know, the luxury wine markets in, in Asia and the consumer demand for brands, you know, is, is really, really strong. Because you know, often markets follow spirits, wine markets follow spirits in terms of trends in a lot of ways. Yeah, okay. um, and particularly those Asian markets have been very strong spirits markets for you know, a decade or so now are really starting to uh, to treat wine as a, as a core part of their celebration consumption occasion as well. So yeah, we, we see that as the single largest growth opportunity for the wine category going forward. Um, in, in Asia, for sure, in terms of expanding in the category, whereas most of the other markets are quite mature. Now, you've got a bit of a story to tell because in, what, July 2020, you were actually appointed CEO of the organisation. I started as CEO July 2020, yeah. I was appointed uh, October the year before, uh, October 2019, so I had, a, had an eight-month transition period. Probably some pretty big shoes. Yeah, Mike, uh, Mike led the organisation, you know, from where we were, which was a uh, the way I describe it is a uh, really enjoyable, collaborative uh, wine company that uh, had a lot of fun doing what we were doing, but were largely unsuccessful from a financial performance point of view. And I guess really, really transformed the organisation, you know, over a three or four year period. And yeah, you know, the big shoes externally, in particular, from a, a share price point of view. Yeah. You know, when Mike joined, it was uh, yeah you know, three but three bucks something the share price, and then. Uh, when he when he left, it was uh, yeah. Well, when he left, it was ten fifty. But during that period of time, we'd uh, we'd got up to sort of eighteen, nineteen dollars. So, you know, he led the charge in terms of really, you know, driving this business and creating a very, very different feeling shaped business. So, when he finally passed over the reins, okay, like you said, you had what eight months to sort of prepare. But when he got originally tapped on on the shoulder, did you want the role? I, I had zero hesitation. Um, and uh, I didn't didn't even think about it when uh, when I got the call from uh, from our chairman to uh, to come and have a chat with him and uh, yeah, whether I wanted to be considered for the role. Uh, yeah, I, I had no hesitation. Yeah, it's something it's something I yeah didn't uh, didn't necessarily yeah, have to do, but uh, yeah, as the chief operating officer beforehand, as the yeah, two I see really for the business, it was yep. quite. I was I was very hopeful I'd at least be considered as part of it. So I had plenty of time to think about, is it something I wanted to do? And in your mind, what were you going to change? What was going to be your stamp on the business? I think the uh, we got to the point where our success had become, uh, our financial success had become, I think, a, uh, a problem for us culturally, uh, because we'd got to the point where yeah, the intensity of Mike, Mike, it goes back to Mike's leadership style too, which was had so many positives, but he was the most intense person you've ever met in your life. You know, and uh, every day, you know, his uh, his intensity was like you know nothing I've ever seen. I thought I was pretty good, but I was the turtle in the race compared to him. And over time, yeah, you know, that becomes you know, that how you're going about things, and it becomes it does become tiring, you know, from that point of view. So it's a period of time. Mike knew that too, and that's this is not something that uh, you know he he would see as a negative because it was his his style and, and it worked. The challenge with that had become, I think, the um, we we worked out we worked out we were winning every six months. We felt like we were winning every six months, which when our results would come out. So, you know, our results would come out and you go, okay, that's fantastic performance. But the feeling within the organisation of the how we were getting there was very, you know, probably we'd heard on the side of outcomes too much in terms of the process um, of how we were getting there. So I think, you know, having getting that winning feeling on a constant basis that the hard work, the effort was, was actually the rewards were coming not just every six months when you produce your results. I think it was an important cultural shift we had to make. You know, I think the uh, the other part of it was, you know, I talk about a two-speed business, particularly in wine, uh, but I think it's relevant for all businesses, but you, you've got to run at two speeds. You've got to deliver today, but also spend the right amount of time on the planning for tomorrow and tomorrow being year two, three, four, five and, and beyond. So, yeah, that was, a, that was a shift where we had to, I call it calm down by 10%. And just take our time with planning. Make sure that we could execute plans better, and give ourselves the best chance to to execute plans, not only in the current year but also in in future years. So that was the uh, that was sort of the real heart of the, the cultural shift I wanted to make, and also to get people at the heart of our our DNA. You know, we we'd had significant turnover, you know, as part of it. And again, it was part of you know Mike's management was you continually turn people over, etc., to to make sure there's that stress in the system. You know, and I just have a different view that, you know, I think a stability, particularly at a leadership team level, is important. So I think having that level of stability was the right, the right shift in culture for the organisation. Yeah, two, two years earlier, 
It wouldn't have been. So it's, it's, it's interesting how, you know, timing works with some of these changes too. I probably wouldn't have been the right leader for this business, one experience wise, but two years earlier, because Mike's style was exactly what we needed then. Why did you stay then up to that point? And obviously, and I understand why you stayed after that point, but why did you stay up to that point? Because Mike is very different in style to what you, know, you talk about. I learned, I mean, he had the best uh, strategic business brain I've ever come across. You know, he, uh, his ideas, his ability to drive innovation, thoughts, you know, what you do to drive growth in markets was, was fantastic. And you know, I'd learn, I learned a lot from him constantly from that perspective. I think secondly is that, you know, I saw myself as having a really important role, you know, as the, you know, the lead, a leader in this business to, uh, you know, to, to play that. I've been here 10 years. My relationships in this business were really strong. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw myself as having a really strong connection. And a lot of what this business was about, even before I came to see, you, I'd like to think was, you know, part of, part of me as well. And, and I was having that influence throughout the business. So, you know, it was a big part of, big part of my life. Yeah, and so, so yeah, that's uh, that's why, and I had some fantastic roles. Yeah, there was plenty to do, and yeah, I travel, I, I travelled the world a lot, too much probably over the uh, over those couple of year periods, sort of understanding the business and fixing some of the things we needed to fix, growing some of the things we needed to grow. You know, the time in China, I spent significant time up there. Yeah, I mean, you don't get the chance to do that well, the, the experience wise. So there's lots of lots of one offs that you sort of think you just don't get the chance to do that we uh, was the opportunity afforded to you know, over that period of time. So you're afforded the opportunity as CEO, but six weeks, seven weeks, you're talking about your planning. You're going to be three. You're talking about three, four, five years ahead, and at the same time keep the company moving in the direction. And you, you know, you're taking the reins. You're catching up with everybody. What what happened? You got a you got a phone call, didn't you? Yeah, I did uh, did uh, did get a phone call on the um, the Friday night after our the first uh, announcement of our full year results. So yeah, basically eight weeks eight weeks in. I'll probably take a step back. We were in the middle of COVID at this point in time too, where uh, to be honest, was more stressful than what I'll get to in a moment around the China piece because. You know, we, we were talking about people's lives and jobs and, you know, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, what was the liquidity of the business. So that first three or four months of COVID was uh, was pretty hairy in terms of, you know, where where were we going to end up? And we, we were in pretty reasonable shape by that point in time. So we got through the worst of that in terms of knowing what the impact might be on the different scenarios of COVID. And it's a great example of you don't, you don't rest on their laurels too much because I do remember on that Friday afternoon, we'd done the results. All went across well. You know, the market, my first time, there's question marks around me taking over from Mike. And you know, I think we did, uh, if I don't mind saying so, a pretty nice job of explaining the, the strategy going forward, how we're navigating the pandemic and uh, did have a couple of a uh, couple of drinks after work with uh, my CFO and uh, investor relations head. And then I got home and got a call from the Department of Foreign Affairs that, uh, that said, uh, we're hearing some, some whispers out of uh, China that there's going to be an investigation into uh, anti-dumping and obviously I knew what that meant um, in terms of uh, one obviously there was no anti-dumping but politically there was something coming pretty uh, significant down the pipe so yeah I uh, didn't have too long to enjoy the moment of our uh, first full year results about two hours actually. so that's uh, that's a Friday night when when did you start putting your plans what did you do did you sit down by yourself over the weekend and think gosh okay if, if this plays to fruition what am I going to do yeah, I did. I um, I spent I spent all the I didn't. I told one other person, so I rang our, our chief counsel, who uh, you know needs to needs to understand these things and deals with uh, corporate affairs and all the rest of it, just to make sure that the information I got, which was only speculation at that point, you know, from a market point of view, yep. just so we made sure we uh, we were covered from an AS, you know, what we had to do externally. Yep. Um, and it was it was only yeah it was, was certainly clear then we weren't there was nothing we needed to announce so once I did that I uh, asked her to keep it to herself until the Sunday night and uh, I spent pretty much the best part of it that weekend bunkered down in my office at home just thinking through a cu couple of key things not only that how do we respond to this business wise but more so around how do I engage through the business now you know with this news that this potentially is coming then you've got to assume yeah you know, something was not going to be a great outcome and calm calm the organization get the right people together what's the communication process we're going to go through because it wasn't public at this point so with a very small group of people so yeah we needed to uh, we need to work through that so 
by 24 hours later, um, you know, I'd, uh, I'd mobilised mobilize the group of teams. We need we needed small group and uh, got together and we started working through where to from here, what do we do, you know, in terms of scenarios, in terms of how to explain it, comms, internal, external, um, and modelling business implications, you know, should the China market and different, uh, different implications happen. Because at that point, it wasn't clear it was going to be you know, tariffs, so to speak, but there was a there was a process we had to go through, and how do you engage with governments and all all those sorts of advisors that exist around the globe? So it was it was more of a I've got a whiteboard at home in my office, so uh, I, I do like a whiteboard too. It's, it's a, bit, I'm a bit old school when it comes to that, but being able to map out all the different pieces of the puzzle allowed me to get my head around it, so that when you know I uh, I could talk to the the leadership team about it that uh, I, was, I was at least calm and methodical in terms of the thought process we needed to go through what was the worst scenario oh, worst scenario was uh we planned out over that next period of time probably an 80 to 90 percent tariff um should should that occur because we sort of assumed pretty quickly that yeah there was going to be a negative outcome of the process and uh yeah, it was going to be tariffs attached to our wine and, and you know it's a market that was Broadly, forty percent of our profit and eighty percent of our growth from the previous five years. So, um, enormous. It wasn't a small part of our business, and um, we did a lot of work around that. And that was based on where uh, any historical um, processes such as this had netted out. So, we took the worst case scenario of the eighty ninety percent. Uh, thought thought then over time that uh, as the investigation. You know, went on and um, we thought we still have a reasonable business in China, even at that level for our luxury wine. And then, of course, the uh, final finding, which was significantly higher from a tariff level of that, which, uh, which did surprise us a touch, uh, meant that it was effectively shut. What was it, what was it 218? Is that right? Yeah, 218. I think uh, I think ours ended up at uh, 179. Was it really? I mean, it sort of, sort of doesn't matter once no. you get to that level. So does that mean that everything just stops then? Or what, what actually happens? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Um, you know, everything that was potentially being sold into that market, um, you know, they uh, just stopped selling into China. Now, your, your leadership mantra is be better every day. It it's is. Not, it's not an easy thing to do. Show up as your, as your best every day. But it's realistic as your, some of your comments you've said out there. How do you do that? When now, as you said, let's wind it back. You're inherited where well, you're now CEO. You've got COVID. So there's no ambiguity left, right, center and unease. Mm -hmm. And you've just had this phone call. You've brought in your, your team, you're dealing with advisors and, and government officials, I assume. How do you turn it on? I, I, I use the word perspective. You know, you, it does, it, it, you have to have great perspective of really what, what is happening around the world. And there's, there's a couple of statements I use a lot with our team and it's, you know, it's to calm things down a touch, but it's also to give perspective, which is one, we're not saving lives. You know, and we're not. We're our job is to make great wines and sell them you know, as best we can, and build brands around the world and create great experiences for people, including our team. So that's number one, and so it's important, you know. And there's shareholders, there's investors, there's all the things that go around it. But at the end of the day, we're not saving lives, you know. And I think secondly, you sort of always have the perspective of there's always someone worse off, you know. And so you don't feel sorry for yourself, and that's a really important perspective because you know when things do go against you, the Nothing I dis, uh, dislike more than those that go into wallowing self pity, because yeah, at the end of the day, there's there's always someone worse off in some situation. So having that perspective is is really important, you know, to to being better every day. And that that's it is it is realistic. I mean, I I have a process I go through which is you know every, every night, and I generally use the time when I'm driving into work in the mornings if I'm in Melbourne anyway. You know, I'm generally on the phone talking to people largely in the US. It's a good time to, to catch up with them. But driving home every night, you know, I, I assess how I performed that day. You know, every interaction I've had, every meeting I've had, you know, it's a 10, 15 minute process I go through where I sort of give myself a, I give myself a, uh, a pass mark or a not. And, and, and it's a really important habit that I've formed and I've been doing that for oh, seven or eight years now. And uh, it's re really important to assess it. And, Generally speaking, I'm pretty happy with most of the things during the day and then, but the, some of the people interactions, and it's more around the people interactions that I assess as opposed to the business decisions we make, which then often will form who are the calls I'm making the next morning when I'm coming into work as well. 
So what do you, when you're assessing, you just you're just thinking out loud. What how I engage with those individuals? Did they do they understand me? Are they going to act upon that? And then you're also looking at your ability to make decisions under, I guess, under pressure or without, like all things, without all information, I assume. Yeah, and, and did, did I get the response? What was the response of people? Because often, yeah. yeah, if you think back what the response of people in those moments were, yeah, so you've got to really think, did that land? Yeah, was their response a negative response? And, and how do you then deal with that from there? Yeah, to me, that's a really important part of a, a leader's role, but certainly, you know, as a CEO where... You got to read what the uh, what the mood of individuals and and the teams are uh, with those interactions, and it's such an important skill. And I think if you keep reflecting on it, you can get better at it. Okay, so you have that call, you 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 catch up with that team, but guess what? That scenario almost starts to coming true, doesn't it? You're in trouble. A large part of your market is going to be not gone, but it's going to be held up for some time, isn't it? Yeah. So what do we do? Oh, look, this, this is a moment where you realise you, you, you're pretty lucky with the organisation, the people you've got. We, we, we have an amazing ability to, to deal with crisis and really deal in a constructive, solution-oriented way. So, you know, our, our team just went straight into solution mode. You know, okay, we've got, this is the amount of inventory we need. We've got, what do we do? What are the key decisions we need to make? How do we how do we really plan now what the business looks like, assuming this is now not part of our business and where do we go from here? And, you know, it, it, it will go down. I'm sure it will go down as whenever, whatever I do in the next X amount of years, I'm in this job, that sort of two, three week period will go down as my proudest moment of our team, how we gathered together, you know, got the different scenarios played out. What do we want to do? How are we going to go about it? Make some decisions and then, and then get on with it. It was, it was brilliant. It was brilliant, and that's not me. That's that's the team in the business, you know, that we have, and it just told me that yeah, you know, we've got a real core culturally and mindset wise. That's a great, you know, the theorists call it growth mindset. I just call it a solution orientation. You know, it was an ability to to solve what was ahead of us. It was just brilliant. So, what is leadership under a crisis, Tim? Because you can't give all the answers, can you? No, no, no. It's it's the opposite. It's absolutely the opposite of that. I think you've got to be calm as the as the as the go to. I mean. End of the day, the whole organisation is looking at me and saying, "What? How do I look and feel and come across? How do I show up?" You know, in those examples, and uh, you know, if they look at their leader and go, "Okay, he's got a plan. He's calm. He's you know, working through methodically. He's got. Uh, he's not panicked." Then that does go through an organisation. So I think your role is to one is to you got to show up. Yeah, you know, with that, you got to be strong. You got to be decisive at that point in time. But the most important thing is, yeah, you've got to have. You've got to have your team with you, you know, and you've got to have them in the uh, in the bunker with you, so to speak, and uh, all aligned on what you're doing and and, uh, and how you're going to take it forward. So it's a it's a great way. Yeah, it just builds stories, right? I mean, this is everyone talks about culture, and you can have whatever you like on your PowerPoint slide, but uh, yeah, you've got to live and breathe it. And you've got to have stories. You've got to have experiences together. It does create a bond, yeah, which is pretty damn strong. And just maybe share some of the stories if you could, or maybe some insights. Did everyone perform the way you thought they would? You know, and it sounds like you had a pretty good solid team. You knew most of them, as you said, you've been there for a period of time. The relationships are there. Any surprises, good and bad? I'd say all surprises on the good side. You know, I think the uh, the will, the willingness to to work, what it, do whatever was required from a time point of view. You know, it was was incredible. I think the the future focus of our team in china at the time was just amazing you know the, our leader up there um you know, at the time was tom king who now leads our penfolds business but also you know some of our our chinese based um or chinese national team that were the leadership team up there they should have gone into a hole right? yeah. they should have, yeah but they didn't you know they, they already started talking about okay how do we now expand our french country of origin portfolios how do we look at our you know, different ways of building this business in China. And importantly, you know, how do we deal with our customers for the longer term here because we're not shutting the gates on China. So there was, there was never a discussion or a mindset to say, okay, we're just shutting down China, we're pulling everyone out, we're sh shutting the business down, let's move on. So during all this, are you assessing people differently? Now, roll it back 10, 15 years ago, we used to evaluate people on their, their gaps, right? let's build up, let's focus on developing their gaps where they're weak. Or did you think about changing it? We focus on their strengths because we haven't got time to mess around. Is there anything going through your mind in that regard? 
that not, not based on that. I mean, my my uh, you talk about leadership philosophy before about getting better every day. That's yeah. that's one. But the yeah, the way I lead and have done now for uh, be 12, 13 years since yeah. I sort of stum- stumbled across strengths based leadership. You know, and um, you get you get exposed to lots of different models and theories, etc., around leadership. But that's the one where I'm like straight away. That's that's what I want to base my leadership style on. In every team I've I've led, and now the organisation that I lead, you know, strengths based leadership is absolutely the fundamental to how we build our discussions around feedback, our development process, how we understand our team, um, and what their specific strengths are. It's a very simple tool; people understand it. And the, and the reason why I like it is, it's motivating. You know, when you're talking, when you're working with your strengths, you you're, you're doing better every day. Yeah. You're creating you know, an environment for you to work in where you're highly motivated, highly engaged. You know, and it's positive. You know, it, it's energising. So it's a really, it's a, it's a much more glass half full view of you know how you look at an individual because everyone's got strengths and everyone's got weaknesses. And I've just always figured that if you spend ninety percent of your time focusing on what you're good at and getting better at it, you're going to have a much greater impact and enjoy the ride a lot more than focusing on the ten percent that you're not good at. All right, so your 2021 annual report mentioned a shift in mindset from recovery and restructuring to one of growth and innovation. Those words are bandied around everywhere in everything you read. What is that? What does that actually mean to you? Build and create. Yeah, build, build and create is the way we talk about it internally. So that's, you know, we, <laughs> you sort of, that's our translation of what a better way to put it. And it, it's a mindset shift because even through this whole period of restructuring and recovery, so not only China change, you know, we um, we also did a significant reorientation slash restructuring of our US business um, over the last 12 months as well. And we completely changed the way we run our business from an operating model point of view. So we've went from, you know, four you know, sales region based divisions to three brand portfolio led divisions, which, you know, was, New 900 odd jobs changed over that period of time. So a pretty big restructure to go through, which is sort of how we, we felt we could run the business and grow the business better if we oriented everyone around brands, portfolios and alignment behind that. So internally for us, it was like, okay, that's done now. The change, you know, the transformational change, it's the bandied around term. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, and, and we're now in this period where I call relative stability for TWE. So, yeah, you know, relative stability for us is probably different to others' stability. But, um, yeah, for us, it's okay, now we go from here. We've, we've laid the foundations, we've laid the platform. It's now time to build and create. Um, and that just shifts everyone's focus to a much more future focus, yeah, so we can so we get on with it. All right, so the job at hand done. We had, it was a tough couple of years in terms of a lot of that change, but the heavy lifting of that is now done so that, that's what it means to us how does the ceo communicate through this process you know you're a global company you're you're in lockdown you've got this going on are you zooming every day like give us a bit of a rundown that's all sounds great hearing it but how do you actually do it now you talk you talk a lot fortunately i like talking um, you know and I, and I also get a lot of energy from talking to people and um yeah so one one you've got to rely on a lot of other people in your business as well so yeah you can't it can't just all come from me so we have uh, obviously the ELT my exec team clearly play a key role in this but we've developed what we call our, our global leadership group um, so our, our second circle mm-hmm. or a better way to put it around leaders about 80 people around the globe who are the next level from a seniority point of view and we, we over invest time and effort in terms of engagement with them with the expectation that they then translate a lot of the detail behind the context behind these changes or what's happening in our business through their organisations as well. Because I, I, you know, I, I'm not a believer in, yes, I have to do town halls and I have to do the, you know, sermon from the mount from CEO, et cetera. But, um, you know, so I think that that's one aspect. You've got to, you've got to have more people within your business. So I figure if we've got a hundred people on the same page in detail and understand the context intimately, then, that's our best chance of our two and a half thousand people and our suppliers and our customers understanding what we're about sort of first point. And the second point is, you know, having this trying to get two way discussion and feedback going in an organization is, is really important through these periods of time. And, you know, this video screen yeah, has certainly been my best friend over the last, uh, the last couple of years. Well, thankfully not so much in the last few months, but, um, 
you know, doing things like we call Ask Me Anything. So I'll, I'll jump on. We use um, Facebook Workplace in our business to communicate, given everyone's love of digital <clears throat> digital these days and, uh, and the line social media. So we have our internal social media channel that we developed over this time as well. So I'll jump on a live stream and anyone in the organisation can jump on and ask me anything. So I do that, my leadership team do that. So you sort of start to build out these forums whereby, yeah, if some, yeah, the way I put it, if it's in your head and you want to get it out of your head, then we need to provide the opportunity for anyone in our organisation to ask that. So it's pretty power. It's been pretty powerful in terms of yeah that engagement and understanding that your leaders are also human as well. I think it's a really important part to to build trust in your business that yeah there is transparency yeah good bad and ugly you'll answer the questions yeah and, and it gives you a chance to be you know decisive and get messages across too so lots of different mechanisms but summary huge amount of talking and when you're going all through that and you're engaging your your, your key executives can i ask was there any particular trends or something if you look back in hindsight you could have acted on a bit more more quicker those who'd been around the block for a long time were they resilient to change or were they quick to address it or did you go to the out to the external market and bring new people in what 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 happened it's a combination so we yeah. uh, we did bring in some external people yeah so my leadership team we brought in two new external people um as well and that, that provided a fantastic different way of looking at our business as yeah. well so so to add to the core that we had that was sort of somewhere between you know five years plus uh experience with the business so i think having that um that point of difference was was helpful. Yeah, we've got a pretty good core of uh, our leaders across the business, you know, have been with us for quite a while and been through the, the ride, if you like. And, you know, it, it is a bit of a roller coaster at times, our business. You know, we, uh, we sort of wear it as somewhat of a badge of honour, that sort of energy, and it is a little bit crazy sometimes. And, and we like that because it means we're moving things forward. You know, we've got momentum. So it's a certain type of person that loves being in this business and it doesn't work for everybody. And we're quite clear about that and we're okay with that as well. You know, so having a mix of people coming in and out is, is always important, but I, I like to have the core of the organization that, you know, they've got the experience, they know how we operate, they know what makes us tick, you know, particularly the global business. You, if you've got relationships, it is so important, you know, you maintain those as well, because they're not easy to create. Who was checking up on you? Uh, well, look, I've got I've got a really uh, a really good network of people that that work with me. I've got a couple of you know coaches and mentors that I you know, I, uh, I I use every month um, and spend time with them every month. They uh, they've been fantastic to uh, to not only guide some of the you know, run things past from a business point of view and yeah, you know, some fantastic mentors uh, from that point of view. Only a couple, but not not you know not too many. But also just some, I've got a coach that I've worked with for over 10 years who knows me pretty well. And um, he, he's more about checking my energy. Am I being balanced? Am I still uh, still doing the right thing at home as well as work? And all, all those sort of things as well. So, yeah, I, I like to have a few people checking. I don't like what they tell me every now and then. But, um, <laughs> you know, they, they certainly they certainly check. I mean, uh, you, have, you have your family as well, but it's different. Yeah, your family, your family check is, you know, you're present when you're at home and are you actually, you know, being a decent either friend, husband, wife, uh, sort of, or wife or, or father or et cetera. So, yeah, well, but, but more so the business mentor check is good. And there's, there's a couple of people on the team that you have grown up with in this business, want a better way to put it. And they'll, they'll tell me if I'm, uh, if I'm getting, going about something the wrong way, you know, I don't have to invite feedback from, from most of my team. So is this a come of the hour moment in that sense? Uh, did you relish the opportunity to shine? Yeah, yeah. Look, um, it, it was, and it's you know, it, it's it's one of those things that you, know, you don't get the chance to do this. I mean, it's as as much as you, know, you get. Oh, you've had a rough first six months and all the rest of it. I sort of I got so sick of people feeling sorry for me because it's not not necessary. Because from a career point of view, as just in a leadership perspective, you just don't get the chance to do this uh, too often. So yeah, it was was really a, a point in time where you, know, you do relish it and you, you learn a lot. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud of how we handled it too from that perspective. But yeah, it is. It was it was certainly one of those moments, one of those periods of time where you shape things that uh, what you want to get in these roles to do. You're listening to No Limitations with special guest Tim Ford. 
In our next episode, I sit down with Anthony Boyd, Chief Executive Officer of Fraser's Property Australia. I think I just wanted to make sure that I had an ambition in terms of achieving things, but it wasn't necessarily trying to draw those in a box and say, by that age, I wanted that exposure or that title, that role. Those things have actually never worried me. They don't actually even worry me now. It's more about saying, what can I have an influence over? What can I potentially help control? And then what's that ambition that we can set collectively and then working with great people and putting those teams around you to achieve those things. Be sure to join us on our next episode. And now back to the show. Where's the business up to now? How's, how's it going? Well, I think, uh, so we'll do our results in, uh, in a couple of months time, but uh, from, a, from a new operating model perspective, you know, we've got three brand divisions you know, our US business is performing the best it's performed in probably 15 years. You know, the team we've got there is doing a fantastic job. So, you know, what was a problem for Treasury Wine Estates is now a serious opportunity. And uh, it's not just me believing it, but the numbers and the performance tells us that's the case. So that's, that's a really, really strong position to be in. And thankfully, given the China market, that's, uh, that's the case. I mean, our Penfolds business, we've surprised ourselves just, I mean, that brand is incredible. I mean, it's, uh, we have we have this serious responsibility to to make sure that we you know, build that into the luxury icon. It should be. It is unique, and we we appreciate that like you wouldn't believe. And um, that that business is again outside of China or other Asia markets, but also Europe and, and America and here in Australia, you know, performing well. And and our our balancing of our whole back end, you know, it's a huge huge undertaking to lose a market like China and then how do you balance your grower base, your, your vineyard assets, your inventories, et cetera, as well, whilst maintaining long-term relationships for the future as well, because you could take a quick a quick cut approach and be back in a really good shape right now in terms of our inventory and our relationships, but people wouldn't want to work with us for the next 10 years. So you know, as the growth in the business sort of continues, you want these relationships and you want these growers and you want these suppliers that are there. So I think we've taken a pretty good balanced approach over those two years uh, to get to that point. So uh, yeah, I feel like yeah, the setup of, of where we are now and the momentum we have, whilst the headlines every time we do our results is, you know, broadly we're flat versus last year and flat versus the year before, We've replaced China of a couple hundred million bucks in that flatness. Uh, so we know the underlying growth of the business there and those that know our business is there, it's actually happening today. So it's not a, here we go, we're gonna deliver it. It's actually there. And uh, the team's feeling really, really good about it. And then just recently, there's a couple of announcements in regards to China. You got a new play there. You wanna sort of share a bit about that and what that could lead to the uh, the growth of the business? Yeah, look, China's, um, when, when we take a step back, when we thought about, okay, what do, what do we now do? You know, let's assume Australian wine is going to be challenging getting into China for the foreseeable future. You don't see that changing? Oh, no, no, I don't. And I probably don't want it to really for the next couple of years. Um, and it sounds a stupid thing to say, I know, but, um, but we're, we're on such a path where one will have created a much stronger business in so many other markets around the globe with the wine we now have available that was destined for China, number one, for our Australian portfolio. But secondly, the, the the mindset of the team up there that I talked about before, you know, to pretty quickly sit back and go, right, there's a consumer opportunity, there's a brand opportunity, we've got the relationships in the market, how do we continue to nurture those over time and bring in a French pen folds and American pen folds and now as we announced this week, you know, a Chinese sourced pen folds you know, to satisfy what is amazing demand in that market, you know, to bring that to life and to start to really fast track those, you know, the diversification of our business in two years time will be incredibly different to what it was two years ago. And that, that's a pretty exciting thing to create and look back and go, okay, as a team, we actually did that uh, to shift the business and it'll be a stronger business, there's, there's no doubt. So that's effectively homegrown grapes out of China, is it? To service the local market? Yep. So, um, yeah, there's a, the Chinese viticulture has improved so much over the last 10, 15 years. There's some fantastic wines being made in China, um, largely consumed in the China market. And, um, and we've had our team up there, you know, trialing winemaking for a number of years. And, uh, yeah, we're now very comfortable that we can make the quality and style that, uh, you know, that hits the standard that we expect, uh, to put our, you know, our luxury brand. You know, attachment to it and um, yeah we, it's a tremendous opportunity it's a 
is really exciting. It's uh, yeah, the first the first launches this year, and that's where we got we, we announced it this week. That uh, you know we'll have a French and American and a Chinese wine in the China market by the end of this calendar year, where we had none of those two years ago. So it's a pretty good thing to do. And those grapes, okay, you have got a French wine. Are they are those grapes originally planted, brought in from France, planted in China? Is that how it works? No, no, French wine will be produced in France, so French grapes in France, and we'll import it into into China. And right. then Chinese grapes, uh, we'll make we'll, we'll make the wines locally. We have made the wines locally, and then uh, distribute locally as well. So, yeah, continue what, what we do in Australia, like we do in um, in the US. No, no different from a French point of view, but uh, but yeah, the Chinese will be more locally sourced. Power of marketing. What's changed? Do I, you know, do you see influences? You don't, is it adverts versus influences? What's going on out there now, Tim? Yeah, it's changed, uh, it's changed a lot. And uh, it's a pretty exciting change, I think, because younger consumers engage with brands so differently now to, you know, certainly 10 years ago, and I would argue three years ago. The social influencing factor that exists and like you say, key influences and their you know, engagement with brands and their ability to then quickly disperse that to large groups of people through social media, you know, if you get it right, can have a huge positive impact. Now you've got to be really clear because if you get it wrong, it can have a huge negative impact as well. So yeah, you know, it's that quickness of response and that immediate consumer feedback of what works and what doesn't means you have to be on top of it, you know, on a daily basis. But for, for wine, which is traditional in terms of its yeah. marketing, you know, traditional in terms of its advertising and its on-shelf presence and heritage and et cetera, et cetera. Consumers are engaging in brands that are, my word, non-heritage brands, made up brands that are more of an FMCG style brand building. So I, I use the example for us around 19 Crimes. You know, 19 Crimes is our second global brand behind Penfolds sold in every market around the world, you know, is now five and a half, six million case business, you know, which which is it's huge and yeah. ranges from, you know, our uh, our tier our tier from Australia, which celebrates the you know the, the criminals of the day to uh, to some of our more uh, premium offerings in the US now, which celebrates the redemption of uh, of crime, which is, you know, where we've we've certainly built the partnerships with the likes of Snoop Dogs and Martha Stewart's and some of these key key celebrity endorsement um, angles and influence angles that leverages their Instagram, leverages their ability to sell, you know, sell product and build brands. It's a remarkably different world. And, um, you know, I think from our point of view, we are building this capability, which is driving a pen folds at the luxury level and being absolutely phobic to building a luxury iconic brand, as well as higher volume, lower price point, but still premium wine um, brands that are, you know, more, more targeted younger consumers that connect with those consumers. So not in crime, squealing pig, these types of brands that just don't have necessarily the heritage. It's a, it's a skill that the wine category, you know, absolutely has to keep developing. So that, that's a big shift. Next 10 years, what are you seeing? Where, where are the growth markets going to be? Is Eastern Block going to open up or is there any other markets going to open up we should be thinking about? Oh, there's, there's a huge runway in Asia still. Yeah, ma massive runway in Asia because we're building a category in Asia. Uh, so it's diff different to America. Everyone goes straight to America, biggest world wine market. Yeah. So there's there's opportunities there as customers premiumize and consumers premiumize. But Asia is still, you know, a a huge opportunity as more consumers come into wine, more consumers come into luxury brands. You know, the middle class is rising. You know, the disposable income continues to to expand in those markets, and the love of brands is is so strong. So. It's um, that, that to me from a market point of view is there uh, as, as the, the biggest opportunity for our whole category, not just our business. I think the, the uh, drink, drinking less, drinking better phenomenon will continue, but also the, the healthier uh, mindset, the health focus of you know, consumers will continue to, to build over time. And you know, so lower in alcohol wines to zero alcohol wines, I'm, I'm a believer that, that is going to be a significant opportunity and a significant category over time for wine. No one's cracked that one. No, it is, uh, it's, early, it's early days. And I think the uh, the key is the technology to actually create a lower and zero alcohol wine that still has the aromas, the tannins, the mouth feel, feel of wine and the, and the taste of wine. At the moment, you're stripping alcohol out and it's through a heating process, which takes out a lot of those factors of wine. And that's what we're all doing around the globe. and 
you know, they're, they're improving, but they're still not, yeah, the, the outstanding sort of consumption occasion, I think, that uh, they could be going forward. So we, we plan to crack that. You know, we've put in a lot of time and R&D into more the technical process inside of things as opposed to the yeah, any anything else at the moment. But then it's creating brands that actually tell the story as well. You know, the other thing I think we've all done is, yeah, okay, let's put a zero alcohol proposition under an existing brand. You know, I think if we, if we truly believe this is the opportunity it is we need to create the category and create those brands that actually tell that story because that's that's what the consumers are looking for so that that's the that's the nut to crack and as you say no one has as yet but uh but we think we're, we're best positioned to do it as the leader in this category we should be we should be the ones leading the charge on this and it is building a category it's not something just for ourselves we think it's a, it's a great opportunity is it the science behind pallets or is the effort behind marketing I'd say it's both, and you knew I was going to answer that that way. Didn't you? <laughs> um, more, more, and more. It depends what level you're talking about, too. So, you know, there's. I'd argue the uh, from a brand from a branding point of view, if you're really at the top end, it's about that elite. You know, if, you, if you're buying a bottle of Grange for thousand bucks a bottle, nine hundred dollars a bottle. You know, you, you you want the status of your drinking Grange. You know, it's a gift. It's a celebration of an occasion. If you're drinking a $15 squealing pig Sauvignon Blanc, I'd argue it's actually branding as well. But you have to have a quality standard that is enjoyable. You have to have that. In between, you know, the science of wine making is still crucial. You know, the uh, it doesn't matter how much you automate anything. If you don't have you know, great winemakers with experience and, you know, that combination of art and science, you know, and the artistic side of it's important. You know, going out in the vineyards and making sure that you know that that quality of fruit is what you're going to need to make the quality of wines. And that's where it starts. It starts in the vineyards, you know, just as much as it does from a winemaking point of view. And the difference in palates across the globe? Is it about educating palates over time? Is that, you know, for someone from, as you say, Southeast Asia through to, you know, France, through to Germany, through to Australia, through to South Africa, through to Portugal? I'm just interesting how you go about those that marketing and the opportunities. Yeah, you get feedback pretty quickly and, and different palates, you know, so an American palate would like sweeter, you know, sweeter wines um, than what you would in some of the more, you know, traditional Australian palates like the big, heavy, you know, tan and full red wines, you know, as a general, I'm generalising, obviously. You know, the French, the French palate's more refined, you know, likes lighter style wines and the Pinot Noirs, et cetera. So, yeah, un unfair generalisations, but it does differ uh, from that point of view. I, I actually think branding of wine propositions is becoming more and more of a, in the hierarchy of decision-making, you know, it's becoming more and more important um, than what it was five, 10 years ago. Opportunity regarding wine tourism and working, and how, how does that kind of play a big role? No, it's big. It's, uh, it already is big. Yeah, but you look at Napa Valley. I mean, Napa Valley, yeah, I, I call it the adult Disneyland. You know, it, it, it really is. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a fantastic place for these wonderful experiences that, are all revolving around wine, not just the, you know, the the cellar doors and the assets there, but the look and feel of the whole uh, Napa Valley is just unbelievable. Here in Australia, you know, the investment that's been made in a number of cellar doors as as tourism, you know, regional tourism, I think is going to continue to be really strong mm -hmm. you know, in this country. I think that's one of the post-pandemic you know, trends that I think will continue. We've, we've probably discovered that we've got a great country to explore ourselves as opposed to always having to go overseas which i think is a good thing for wine tourism you know and, and the investments there's coming i mean we just um we just launched a new cellar door and facility up in the yarra valley that we did in partnership with uh, jerry ryan and his uh, his group where it's a world-class cellar door hubert estate that has you know, restaurants cellar doors a um, indigenous art exhibition a conference center you know soon to have a hotel attached to it as well the more people people love these experiences, these experiences they can get, you know, they can't get anywhere else. You know, and wine provides that. You know, there's no there's not too many others that can provide that when you combine that wine, food, experience, being away, being with friends. It's a huge opportunity. Supply in the world of wine, Tim. Oversupplied now or where, where's it sitting? Broadly at a global level, it's slightly oversupplied. More so at the sort of called ten dollar, ten dollar and below price point. So you know, I think very, very much so from if you get European wine, French, Italian is slightly uh, supply exceeding demand at the moment. US is the opposite. US has 
demand exceeding supply, whereas two years ago it wasn't. So it does just pretty quickly. And here in Australia, um, yeah, supply does exceed demand and probably will for another 12 months or so as the industry writes itself on the back of, uh, back of China. Two big things, inflation, interest rates. Is that where, where do you see the world headed and where do you see the impact to your business? I'll, I'll start with, I, I use the US as the, as the lead example from our business point of view because you know, they've sort of had the inflationary rates, you know, the high petrol prices, high services, all that sort of stuff for three or four months longer than here and interest rate rises as well. We, for our business, we haven't seen a significant shift in demand um, and we don't sort of expect to at a, at a more premium price point level because there's some, I think there's some unique dynamics this time around whereby, yes, there is high cost of living and yes, interest rates are going up. However, there's high levels of savings that exist in households. And I think, unfortunately, I think the divide between you know, the lower income earners and the middle to higher income earners is probably gonna be you know, the, where the real issue hits over this next sort of 12, 18 month period. So. It, we think it will impact more the sort of lower end of the line category, the sort of below ten dollars. So that's that's um, that's something we're monitoring pretty closely. We also, you know, with the input costs, with that sort of more premium price points, we've we've been pretty successful in in taking price ourselves. So I guess contributing to the the cost of living um, issue, but you have to pass through some of these costs that are coming largely from supply chain, largely from packaging, logistics, etc. But being very targeted in doing it as opposed to you know, what it says lazy to the broad price increases we've been very specific on brands and varieties and price points where our brands can and consumers that consume those brands can actually pay increase and we don't think it will impact demand over time so um, yeah it's it's you got to develop that real top line management and cost management capability through this period of inflation i think that's the big shift because we're assuming it's going to be here for a while um, so that that's a big impact, and I think it, to be honest, our people, yeah, that's where we're going to see that over the next twelve months. I mean, we've got a responsibility to, you know, to to manage our remuneration structure, of course, but we've got a really big responsibility to make sure that yeah, we're looking after our people as we go through these sort of processes. And and I sort of talk about it in the same way I talked about it as the macro view before. Mm-hmm. We've got a we've got lower income earners in our businesses. We've got higher income earners, so. Do I, do I need a pay rise that increases, you know, matches inflation? No, I don't. You know, but does, you know, someone at lower levels of our business that's earning 70, 80, 100 grand a year who are going to be bitten by interest rate rises and the rest of it need a, a bigger pay rise to help them manage through this period? Absolutely. So that, that's going to be our philosophy, how we look at managing it internally. So yes, it'll add some cost to our business. We'll give, yeah, we'll, we'll adjust our pay scales more than we have you know, in the last 10 years. You haven't got much choice, have you? Yeah, you haven't got much choice. It's the right thing to do as well. You know, I mean, if you haven't got your people engaged, you know, for the sake of a few million bucks, then what are you? What are you doing? Really, that's uh, it's a pretty important philosophy to have. So that's probably the most important part. And then monitoring the consumer demand just to see what that shift is. Go back and you know you're playing under 19s years ago. As a skipper, you've got to pick the team, right? And you've got to have that chat. You're not playing today, or you're not playing next week. So you've had that in the past. You now got the, your team. You've come through some difficult times. It sounds like it's looking very positive, as you're saying. Markets are looking very reasonably healthy, and opportunities look very good. As a skipper or as, or as the chief exec, what do you look for for someone to join your team now? There's three. I mean, what it depends on my whether it's my team or sort of different parts of the business. But to answer the direct question with my team, yeah, you know, I think certainly an experience experiences that we don't have. You know, so if I think about the world of digital, you know, the classic digitization PowerPoint that everyone seems to flick around at the moment. And what are you doing around digital and data and insights and all the rest of it? I think we've done a, a reasonable job at getting ourselves to the point now where you know, we've got going on a number of these you know, key areas that we know are the future of our business, whether it be data collection, automation, but also digital engagement right through consumers, but also how we run that through our supply chain. You know, how do we take data from our, our vineyards, for example, and you know, create best best in class water systems, you know, pesticide management, all those sorts of things. Yes. And and so we've got pockets all over the business, but none of us on the leadership team, including myself, have done that before, pulling that all together. So by way of example, that that's an area where I think we need to bring in capability. Because uh, we've all got good ideas and we've all got good intentions, but we haven't done it before. Yep. 
you know. And so I think there's a capability experience gap. Who's done that before? Number one. Secondly, is you know, are they are they culturally team dynamic going to be a fit? You know, if you look at our I talked about strengths beforehand. You know, we've got our matrix that has all of our strengths as a leadership team and. You know, whenever we would bring someone on, we'd be going through that process pretty intently to make sure where are they going to fit in our matrix in terms of what do they bring, where do they sit, is it more of the same, is it not? But then really having an action orientation and culturally, you know, being a transparent person can show that, you know, fits in that uh, the real sort of DNA of what we're trying to create across the business because every leader has, has to exhibit that. So it's that, that sort of behavioural, cultural fit, and that's a hard one. Yeah, the experience bit's probably the easier bit. Yeah, you know, as long as you can find the uh, the right experience, delve into it, and you know, pay what you need to pay to get that person, you can get that. But it's that cultural fit where you spend a lot of time analysing the person, understanding, conversing with them, you know, across a number of people in our team. So that's uh, that's the second criteria for sure. Yeah, you know, I think the last one's sort of ambition. Yeah, you know, I think. Uh, Bringing, bringing some of the understanding what they want to be in 10 years' time or where they want to go is, is a really important factor, you know, particularly senior roles in the business. You know, do they want to, they want, they want my job in 10 years' time? Are they at a point in their career where they just want to create something different for the last 10 years of their career? And those sorts of questions, I think, are, are really important to understand. Does everyone have to fit? A lot of the time you get the question, you got to, you know, you got that short list. You're the client, speaking from our end anyway, all, all about fit, is it? Oh, I think absolutely. Yeah. You don't want to break with fit sometimes? Depend, depends what break the fit means. If it's, you know, if you've got a different perspective, a different experience, a different style, that's, that's fine. If you are mindset driven that is different, um, you know, and if I take our three values, you know, which is you bring, we bring our whole self, we deliver together and we are courageous. Whoever comes onto our leadership team doesn't tick those three boxes, then nah, that to me is fit. And I, I don't want someone that doesn't exhibit those three behaviours because you can't have someone in your leadership team not doing it when you're asking the whole organisation to do it. Can you talk me through those three behaviours again? You said bring your whole self? Bring your whole self. We are courageous and we deliver together. That's our three, you know, our three statements that form our twee DNA, as we call it. And that's what we measure ourselves against. That's how we talk about you know, how we reward behaviours, how we provide feedback when we don't see it is all revolving around those three pretty simple statements, but pretty important statements for us. And when did you arrive at those, Tim? Was that uh, under your leadership or pre? The first day I took over, we launched those. Did so you? that was... Uh, that, was so uh, that must have been... Think you must have been thinking about that then somewhat. Uh, yeah, so that, that was one of the good parts of having eight months from a transition <laughs> point of view. Um, you know, I had, I had a bit of runway to develop some of those sort of, particularly, you know, those sorts of things that we wanted to change and be really clear on. Because, And I, I was pretty pretty big on the fact that day one when I took over, I had to be clear on this is the expectation that I want to set across the organisation. That was day one. You said it as such, everybody, you're on, you're on my bus. Yep. Looking over the hill, right? How do you keep yourself abreast as a CEO to look over the hill? You got to you got to keep asking a lot of questions, you know, a lot of questions. And I, and I spend I, I had this list uh, that I that I run on a well, it's a week it's a weekly basis. I call it 30, 60, 90, but it's a, generally it's a weekly list, and it's got four four buckets to it. It's uh, people, so I've got a list of things I've got to worry about, deal with, make sure we've got in place around people. Uh, Strategy is the second one. Third one's financials. So to me, my my job is those three. Um, and then I've got a list of external. And the external is relationships, uh, future, and also, you know, from a business point of view, the, the macro environment that's happening around the world, you know, because it's it's a mental mental challenge to know where's America going to go, where's Europe going to go, where's Asia going to go, and Asia is a group of 20 different countries that we've got to try and understand what's happening in these different markets and environments around the world. So to make sure that we are, if we fast forward three years, five years time, are we are we future fit for what's going to happen in these markets? So I, I spend a lot of time seeking that information. We don't have huge amount of consulting advisors or those sorts of things in our business. Um, you know, we, we have a gap. We bring in consultants, but it's pretty rare. So you know, that's that's our job to find that out. And we've got people all around the world. So the network we have to bring that information to our business is crucial. So 
How do I get the best out of you? I think if you give me the uh, give, give me an opportunity that can create something, you know, that's, I'm, I'm driven by, uh, yeah, what, what's something you can look back on and go, I did that, you know, and it, and um, and I'm very much and whilst I hate using the term I, you know, because it is you know it is about the, the we here and all the rest of it, but from my point of view, personally motivating myself, you know, incremental is not not me. Um, you know, how do you how do you really fast forward and go and you can look back? We did that. We created something that other people can't do. You know, there's a big driver in me to do the things that are either too hard or others say you can't do. And that's um, yeah, that's what's challenging. That's what I love. I love the uh, the day I took over this job or the week I took over this job and all the analysts going, Oh, we're gonna sell the US business now. Like, nope. It's gonna be it's gonna be absolutely a growth engine for our business and you know, a few of them have said, and it was in the press at the time, that, oh, well, it won't last too long. That's another another failed uh, leadership. And we're not there yet, don't get me wrong. There's a long way to go. But, yeah, that's the sort of thing I want. Nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show uh, from that point of view. So it's uh, hopefully it's channeled for good and not evil. And uh, But that's probably the bit of my ego that comes through, you know, with what drives me on a daily basis. I, th- I think the other the other part is variety. Right? So this, this job's fabulous from a point of view of, yeah, I mean, every CEO has variety, but I have the variety of different, a, a category that everyone loves, right? And not everyone, a lot of people love. You know, so people want to talk to you about what you do. You know, it's actually got nothing to do with me. It's actually the, the job that I have. And I really find that terrifically engaging, you know, when you're, at a, when you're out or you're talking to someone you've never met before and you say, I work for a wine company, they want to talk about it, which is pretty cool. And I think also the fact you go you can go to America, we're in Europe, we're in Asia, we're here, the variety of where I need to be, how I go about things, who I've got to deal with, yeah, that that's that's something that gets me out of bed every day. What about the um the contrast, the hard part about being the CEO, um, or, or a captain or anything, I guess, at the top level? Lonely at the top, is it? No. No, I've never I've, I've honestly, honestly never found it. Uh, yeah, I've never felt it. And 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 I think yeah, I think the relationships I have with the the team, that um, the exact team, probably helps that. I'm sure, but yeah, I, uh, even it's a common theme, but I just haven't felt it. Haven't felt lonely. Look, you have times where you sit back and go, right, where are we going to go here and how you do this, but that's not a lonely thing. That's your job. So no, I, I don't feel isolated. I don't feel lonely. I don't feel one out at all. And the confidence has always been through, even through you know, the tough times you've been through, as you say. You've got governments playing up against you. You've got world markets. Yeah. And then you've got uh, COVID. And then you've got sales and marketing programs. And you've got people getting tapped on the shoulders left, right, and center. And then you've got the press. Any moments of self-doubt? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Um, and, and self-doubt more where you're going through something you haven't done before. You know? And then you sort of come back to this perspective piece I touched about earlier, which is you go, well, okay, I just, this is what I think. This think the right way is to do it. And you live and die by it. And uh, and I, you know, I genuinely have the the mindset and philosophy that do it my way, and if someone else can do it better than me, then they're probably going to get a chance to do it someday. But you want to do it your way, and um, you know, hopefully consider all views around and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, yeah, you got to you got to have a go and get it right. And sometimes the bit that's most uncomfortable is yeah, it's the exciting part. But it does it's ner- more nerve wracking than. Uh, lacking confidence you go well, what's the what's the response going to be here yeah particularly externally actually in, internally I, I don't have too many of those moments i've got to say but um externally yeah definitely so from someone who's traveled the world seen every country tasted probably most wines met some most interesting people what is when you sit down at that bottle of wine or whatever bottle of wine is what is the perfect experience for you in drinking wine i'm gonna i'm gonna give two the, the perfect one yeah, from a, with with the team, you know, is that where yeah, we've, we've just got some fantastic you know, venues, assets around the place. But yeah, we, we get to do some things that make your friends jealous. Yeah, we get to as a as a team, you know, we get to have dinners sitting in the middle of vineyards, you know, with customers or whoever it might be. But you do you sit back and you go, and not many people get to do this. You know, and, and it does it's come down to that sort of celebration, the entertainment occasion, but you're doing it in a place where you're sitting in the middle of Napa Valley and you're looking up around, you know, both sides of the mountain range and you're like, yeah, this, you know, don't feel sorry for me. You know, that's uh, that's sort of one side of it. The other one, which is personal, is 
you know, we, uh, we, we've re renovated our house. Well, my wife renovated our house. I can't claim too much uh, on that one. And we have a, a wonderful you know, wine wall, so to speak, underneath our stairs, which uh, has about you know, a lot of bottles of wine, four, four or five hundred bottles of wine that I've uh, bought over the, uh, over the years. And every time people come over to our place, you know, I, it's one of the great things where they go, just go and pick what you want. You know, so and and then they whatever they bring back, I generally know exactly the story behind that wine. And you know, it's uh, yeah, the romance of wine. You, know, you can overplay it sometimes. You know, particularly the CEO, you got to be careful you don't. But that gives me the opportunity to indulge in the romance of wine. You know, with a level of knowledge that's probably above everyone else in the room. So it's probably one of the few times I can actually, you know, have that when I'm talking to winemakers and the rest. We're on a long way behind them. So. Yeah, the opportunity to go, right, go and pick whatever body you want, bring it to the table, I'll tell you the story behind it. That's pretty cool. Tim, if you were to look back at that young man standing behind the stumps, captaining that team, what advice would you give him now? I would say, uh, yeah, make, make every day count. Whatever it is, yeah, make every day count. But certainly from a, you know, a career point of view, yeah, do, do the things and take on the opportunity that probably other people don't want to do. You know, I think that's always it's something to get yourself uncomfortable and, and try things that you just might surprise yourself you're pretty good at. So, yeah, that's that's always, I think, great advice. I was given it early. And the last bit of advice I've given, which the single best bit of advice I've ever been given, which is if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're the dumbest person in the room. So from a leadership point of view, you know, like always remember that, that uh, you are not the smartest person in the room and you'll be a much better leader if you live and die by that. On that, team, it's been absolutely terrific to catch up today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Fred. Cheers. You've been listening to No Limitations. No Limitations.